say about this. So how about this? Look like there's no controversial. Can you point to me? I'm ready to go. Good evening. I hereby call to order the action session of the Board of School Commissioners for Thursday, May 24th. The colors this evening will be posted by the color guard from Northwest Community High School, uh, led, by, led by Cadet Major Anthony Brown, Cadet Sergeant First Class Anishka Rivera, Cadet Sergeant First Class Ismail Clarillas, Cadet Sergeant First Class Jennifer Salguera. Thank you to the color guard from Northwest Community High School. Mr. Mulholland, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Arnold? Here. Commissioner Bentley? Here. Secretary Gore? Here. Commissioner Hoops? Here. Vice President Moore? Here. President O'Connor? Here. Commissioner Sullivan? Here. Thank you, Mr. Mulholland. We'll now adopt the agenda for tonight's meeting. The agenda was reviewed on Tuesday and reflects all modifications and changes. Uh, reviewing the modified agenda, are there any requests uh, for changes to the agenda as presented? I would note that the high school construction update list on the new business on Tuesday has been moved to superintendent's report. The agenda item was misplaced on the agenda and there's no action item required for this. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. It has been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The agenda is adopted. We'll now proceed to section two of the agenda. This evening's student performance will be provided by the Floro Torrance School 83 Bucket Drummers. Regrettably, this will be the final performance before the summer break, so please welcome tonight's students before uh, performers from School 83.
give another hand to the School 83 Bucket Drummers. <laughs> Moving on to special recognition, recognitions. We have one special recognition this evening, followed by recognition of our 2018's valedictorians and salutatorians. Commissioner Bentley, would you introduce our first recognition? Today, we would like to acknowledge Jermaine Russell, also known as B. Swift, radio personality for Hot 96.3. Would he like to come forward? <laughs> B. Swift was nominated for his longtime ongoing support and extensive volunteer efforts with Indianapolis Public Schools. His service to the district includes hosting the staff versus student games at Northwest and Attucks High Schools, working with the after school program at George Washington High School hosting rocket relays for Broad Ripple High School, bringing a national recording artist to Ar Arsenal Technical High School to inspire students, hosting a pep rally at Crispus Attucks High School for the school's 200 2017 state basketball championship, hosting the high school closure meetings last spring at each of the district's high schools where he moderated a student panel discussion. He also encouraged students to share their honest feedback with the district leadership in attendance. B. Swift enjoys highlighting exceptional IPS students on the radio, interviewing players from Attucks 2017 state championship team, and our Vals and Sows. He'll be interviewing members of this year's group of scholars next week. B. Swift quietly does many other things behind the scenes, including reading to students at our elementary school. He even threw a pizza party at his own expense for one school to reward students for their reading. For all these reasons and more, we are happy to recognize and honor B. Swift for serving as a role model to our students and providing outstanding dedication to Indianapolis Public School. B. Swift, thank you so much for your service. Each year, Indianapolis Public Schools is honored to celebrate our top scholars from each high school. Our valedictorians and salutatorians not only represent academic excellence, they are also students who are actively engaged in their schools and communities. We now present to you our 2018 Vals and Sows. As we call your name, please come forward to receive your certificate and take a photo with Superintendent Dr. Lewis Faraby and the Board of School Commissioners President, Michael O'Connor. This year, Arlington has two set of vows and styles. The second set includes the top two graduates who transferred to the school from John Marshall Community High School. It converted to a middle school for the 2017-2018 year. Our first valedictorian is Tisha Barron with a GPA of 3.66. Tisha has been involved in cheerleading, volleyball, and cross country. She is also a member of student government and the National Honor Society and has served as social awareness officer of the Jobs for American Graduate Program. Tisha will enroll in IUPUI this fall where she plans to study biology and pre-med on her way to becoming an anesthesiologist. Tisha is unable to join us, but let's congratulate her on all her accomplishments. Arlington's style is Joy Mosey with a GPA of 3.53. Joy is proud to be a native of Barbados in the Caribbean islands. At school, she is a member of the National Honor Society. In the fall, Joy will enroll at Ivy Tech Community College, where she will study culinary arts. She plans to eventually open, open her own restaurant. Let's congratulate Joy. Valedictorian Lanaysha McNeil, a former John Marshall student, is a member of the National Honor Society. Her GPA is 3.83. 
Lanasia will enroll at either Ivy Tech Community College or Bennett College, an all-girls school in North Carolina, where she will major in business. She plans to become a real estate agent and agency owner. Congratulations. <laughs> Unable to be here this evening. Salutatorian Mariah Voiles, a former John Marshall student, serves as secretary of JAG, Jobs for America's Graduates. Her GPA is 3.81. She is a member of Arlington's choir and student government. In the fall, Mariah will enroll at either Ivy Tech Community College or IUPUI to major in elementary education and minor in culinary arts. She plans to become an elementary school teacher. Thank you, Mariah. This year's valedictorian is Rachel Stillman with a GPA of 4.25. Rachel is a member of the National Honor Society and has played both softball and volleyball at Tech. In the fall, Rachel will enroll at the University of Indianapolis to major in computer science. She plans to become a programmer. Arsenal Tech salutatorian is Tanya Pliego Torres with a GPA of 4.919. Tanya is a member of Tech's theater program and show choir. She's also participated on both the soccer and tennis teams. Tanya will enroll in Purdue University where she plans to major in brain and behavioral sciences. She wants to become a pediatrician or pediatric neurologist. The 2018 valedictorian from Broad Ripple Magnet High School for the Arts and Humanities is Jennifer Argumento with a GPA of 4.17. Jennifer here? Okay. <laughs> Jennifer is the first generation middle school, high school, and college student. She's the president of the Broad Ripple's chapter of the National Honor Society and vice president of the student council. Jennifer will enroll in Indiana University beginning, beginning this summer and will major in international studies. She plan, plans to become a humanitarian and lead a corporation. Congratulations, Jennifer. <clears throat> the salutatorian at Broad Ripple High, High School is Jasmine Murphy with a GPA of 4.13. Jasmine here. Um, Jasmine is multilingual. She speaks Mandarin, Japanese, French, and English. She interns for an English-speaking Japanese news site, interviewing Japanese guests, writing reviews, and translating news. Jasmine will enroll in Colorado University in the fall to major in marketing with certificates in international business, talent management, and quantitative finance. She plans to become a business owner. Congratulations, Jeff. From Crispus Attucks Medical Magnet High School, the valedictorian is Benari Haparachi with a GPA of 4.33. Benari is a member of the National Honor Society and volunteers at Eskenazi Hospital the Domestic Violence Network, and the No More Club. Benari is undecided about college. She will attend this fall, but will major in neuroscience. She plans to become a surgeon. <laughs> Maria De Leon is the, sal the salutatorian at Crispus Attucks with a GPA of 4.19. Maria is a first generation high school graduate and college student. She is an activist and the Domestic Violence Youth Network. She will enroll in Butler University to double major in political science and peace and conflict studies. 
Maria plans to become president and CEO of a nonprofit organization that empowers you. From George Washington Community High School, this year's valedictorian is Esmeralda Velasco Garcia with a GPA of 3.94. A first-year generation college student, Esmeralda is a member of JAG, Jobs for America's Graduates, the National Honor Society, and the Yearbook Club. Esmeralda enjoys coding and will major in software development when she enrolls in Ivy Tech Community College. She plans to become a web developer. The salutatorian at George Washington is Jaina Wilson with a GPA of 3.68. Jaina has been a member of George Washington's band since eighth grade. She plays the trombone and has been drum major for the past three years. In the fall, Jaina will enroll in Ivy Tech Community College to study culinary arts and photography. She plans to become a pastry chef, restauranteur, and photographer. From Northwest Community High School, the valedictorian is Abiodin Akinse with a GPA of 4.11. Abiodin is the, an artist and athlete who is a member of the drama club, plays soccer, and spends most of his time drawing. Abiodin will enroll at Butler University to study psychology, art, and technology. He plans to become a psychologist and artist. <laughs> Bolotifa Precious Adekanye is a salutatorian at Northwest with a GPA of 4.02. She is a native of Nigeria Bolatifa is a member of Northwest Volleyball and Tennis Teams, the National Honor Society, and the JROTC, Thrill and Raiders Team. Bolatifa will attend Ball State University to study public relations. She plans to focus her public relations skills in the area of immigration law. valedictorian at Short Ridge International Baccalaureate High School is Michael Snodgrass with a GPA of 4.3945. Michael couldn't be with us tonight, but we're going to talk nice about him tonight. <laughs> Michael has a gift of, of ex an exceptional memory and the ability to remember facts for long periods of time. He credits this trait for his success in school. In the fall, Michael will enroll in Purdue University to major in electrical engineering technology. He, pl he plans to become an electrical engineer. <laughs> Ty Lynn Johnson is the salutatorian at Short Ridge with a GPA of 4.3881. Is Ty Lynn here? Okay. Mm -hmm. He's an avid writer and has completed a draft for a novel he started in middle school. He also fights for a number of social justice issues in a variety of ways, including performing in drag. Tylen will enroll in the University of Indianapolis, where he plans to pursue a career in policy analysis and advocacy. Please help us congratulate these amazing youth.
time. Let's, uh, let's have one last round of applause for our vows of South 2018. Congratulations to all of them. Moving to section three, opening comments. Does any commissioner wish to offer opening comments this evening? Commissioner Before Arnold. they all leave, I know they're on their way out, but the thing that struck me tonight uh, in the readings about each of the students is how many of them plan to go into uh, human rights kinds of uh, careers and advocacy and uh, immigration and those kinds of things. So I just think that's refreshing that our young people are coming up with those kinds of values and passion to do that work. So very commendable. Good. Any other commissioners? Moving on, we'll now receive public comment from those individuals who have signed up to offer comments to the board this evening. I will remind our speakers that you are allowed three minutes to offer your comments to the board. Timer will start when you begin, and I ask that you briefly conclude your remarks when you hear the timer go off. Comments should be directed to the board collectively, should not be abusive or disruptive, and should not address a topic that might be of a confidential nature or that would compromise the impartiality of the board. I would also remind our speakers that while the board is happy to receive your comments, we will not respond or answer questions at this time. If you signed up to speak on a particular, particular topic, on tonight's agenda, you would be called to speak when that item is before the board. Please come to the podium and begin your comments when your name is called. Mr. Gromisbacher. Patrick Lavin, please, if present. Caitlin Lisher. Dear IPS Board of Commissioners, I am a current teacher at Super School 19 who had asked you to vote against converting my school into an innovation school. I did not speak in front of you last month due to a fear of retaliation from my administration. This fear, it turns out, was not unfounded. It seems as if the job security at Super School that was promised to us by our administration, they said at multiple staff meetings we want to take everyone with us, was not guaranteed because several teachers were asked not to return including a Hubbard Award-winning teacher and our athletic director, both who have been at our school for years and are an integral part of our community. Both of these teachers had expressed concerns about converting to an innovation school. It is sad that they are choosing to get rid of such talented teachers, especially considering that out of all K-8 to classroom teachers, there are only four teachers that are definitely staying and are not looking for positions elsewhere due to un how unhappy they have been with this process. And although I find this very troubling, and I hope you do too, I'm here tonight not to be problem focused, but solution oriented. In order to not create the amount of conflict and strife in other schools that the process created at Super School, I have supplied a list of four suggestions that I believe the board and the innovation officer should consider implementing in the future. Commissioners, I urge you to take responsibility for your role in approving innovation schools. Every commissioner who voted yes to the conversion said their approval was based on the need to trust the process. It seemed that you questioned our need to become an innovation school when we were already autonomous and should have been already doing many of the things that were being proposed. Superintendent Fairby even had to tell Mr. McClure that he was not answering your question satisfactorily and needed to, quote, provide more concrete responses. The only reason given for the four approving votes was that Mr. McClure went through and somehow passed an application process with Ms. Johnson, so you had to believe in the process. I agree it is important to trust well-intentioned and thoughtful processes that have been created. However, I'm asking you to consider revising the process that destroyed the culture and environment at the school that I love. I would like to remind the commissioners that they are an essential part of the process and not simply the last blind rubber stamp that seals the deal. You were required to sign off on this, and yet many of you passed the responsibility of the decision to Ms. Johnson and her team. It was disappointing to feel like no matter what was said or shared with you, it didn't matter because your decision had already been made based on the fact that the application had gotten this far in the process. 
Had we known that it was all going to come down to Ms. Johnson's opinion, we would have spent our time getting in contact with her to share information rather than the board. In fact, one of my recommendations is that Ms. Do Johnson actually visits the school and talks with the teachers and community because I believe that presence and her great insight was sorely missed in our experience. Thank you for listening and for all you do for our students. I hope that by revising the innovation process, we can ensure that this process does not negatively impact teachers and students at other schools like it did at Super School. Thank you very much. Elod Nichols Kaufman, please. Good evening, IPS community members, teachers, families, students, and members of the school board and administration. I'm Alad Nichols Kaufman, a student at Shortridge. You might remember me from a previous meeting. As a student at an IPS high school, I'm concerned about how the budget cuts are being managed, particularly in the issue of which schools are being affected. IPS has decided that cuts should impact larger schools rather than smaller ones. I don't know who made that decision, but I do know that that impacts will be devastating for students like me. Next year, the largest schools will all be high schools, which are going through massive changes, some tripling in size. The last thing we need is to leave these schools coping with even more. Next year, we might lose our after-school activity buses, our laptops, our uh, field trips. I wanna know how you think we can learn with three times as many students and less money per student. Another one of these issues is how IPS has decided to manage cuts to innovation schools. Which of these are gonna be cut? After all, IPS does provide them funding, just like the regular public schools. The poorer innovation schools like, um, will be, suffer just like the rest of IPS, but schools like Heron, which tend to have a wealthier student body, won't be af uh, affected at all. They won't lose a cent. You'd think that IPS, when looking where to cut, will look to Heron, where the school already receives additional funding through grants, state funding, and additional federal funding. Regular IPS schools don't get any money at all that doesn't come through the district. Instead, no one wants to stand up to Heron's management and tell them we need to renegotiate the agreement with Heron or any of the other innovation schools. You must do this if you want to continue providing quality education to students at your traditional public schools. In this meeting, the school board is considering uh, approving general fund appropriations. This essentially means that IPS is asking for more tax money to support itself through the year. Now, while I do think IPS does need additional tax money, uh, I think where it's going is a problem, and I'm quoting here from your agenda on the 22nd. The general fund appropriations are necessitated due to two innovation agreements approved in May 2017, subsequent to the initial appropriation approval in March 2017. You're not looking to, for more money to help your public schools, not your high schools that are already being cut while their size is increasing, but only to pay for more innovation schools, which have already been shown to be a bad idea. I mean, you just heard the previous speaker, the issues that they're facing at 19. Please do the right thing and renegotiate these deals with innovation schools and focus your energy on your real, regular public schools instead. Thank you. That concludes public comment for this evening. I've received opening comments from the board and public will now proceed to the consent agenda. The items included on the consent agenda were reviewed at our agenda review session on Tuesday and reflect all necessary modifications. Are there any questions or requests to remove an item from the consent agenda? Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we move to board reports. The uh, Finance Committee met on Wednesday, May 16th um, for some updates on a couple of our policies, cash, man cash, ma cash management policies, excuse me. Took actions on two issues. Uh, which will come before the board in June. One was an investment policy update, which will be uh, really as a uh, renewal of our current investment policy update with some minor modifications. And then consideration of general obligations bond for some IT expenditures. Again, that's not gonna be an item we take action on this month, but we'll probably take in June. Is that right, Weston? So those are the items that came up in the uh, meeting. I think our next meeting, again, for folks who wish to 
learn about maybe greater details of our finances, our next meeting is scheduled for August 15th, 2018, here in the uh, uh, boardroom. I think at, uh, do we have a time for that? 5 p.m.? 5 p.m. on August 15th. I'll now turn the agenda over to Dr. Farabee. Thank you, President O'Connor. Good evening, commissioners. The first item on superintendent reports is item 6.01. I am delighted to introduce our school spotlight for the month. Uh, this month's school spotlight is Lou Wallace School 107. We're pleased to report that we have the principal, Jeremy Baugh, with us tonight, who will highlight the work of his team to better support students and families at Lou Wallace. Uh, again, we're excited each month to spotlight schools that are progressing in academics and overall performance and outcomes. It's important to know commissioners due to the summer break as highlighted with the student performances that we will resume the school spotlights in August uh, after our June and July meetings. With that introduction, we welcome you, Jeremy. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me here tonight. As Dr. Farabee mentioned, my name is Jeremy Ball. I am the proud principal at Lou Wallace School 107 on the west side. So I'll take you through just a brief overview of our presentation this evening. Is that me? Am I clicking here, folks? Perfect. Thank you. All right. So um, we'll start off with a little overview of ISTEP data and growth. Growth is what I'm most excited about at Lou Wallace, as you will see. Um, instructional priorities and focus areas for us and uh, next steps into the school year. So uh, this is my third year at Lou Wallace and our team is growing and doing a fantastic work on the west side of Indianapolis. Our community over there at Lou Wallace is made up of preschool through sixth grade, just over 600 students, projected at 678 students in the fall of 2018 and 19. We had 363 students just two years ago when I started and we are over 600 now. So as you can see, we are a growing school. We proudly represent 37 different countries in our school and 27 languages. That is a challenge to reach those children and reach those families, and we think that we're doing it very well. I'm very proud to announce that we have a 97% teacher staff retention rate this year. We've worked incredibly hard the first two years to retain high quality teachers, and 97% of our teachers are coming back. The only teacher that is leaving us this year is retiring, and we're very sad to see her go, but we wish her well. We have a partnership with IUPUI in which we had 13 student teachers in the fall um, and this past spring we had 23 student teachers in our classrooms working with children. Most of our classrooms had between two and three adults working in the rooms. So at Christmas or just after we took a middle of the year assessment, the Dibbles and TRC assessments. These are reading assessments which measure primary reading scores and then TRC is just text and reading comprehension. That assessment is most similar to uh, the readability or level of reading of a child. And we were very excited to learn that we were the third highest growth school uh, in the district, both on Dibbles and TRC. And since then, we have been completing our end of year benchmark assessments. And uh, prior to this slide deck coming out, or excuse me, after the slide deck came out, we just finished up our end of year fifth and sixth grade students. Um, have grown from 24% of our kids on track in TRC. That's the one that really measures their readability and their ability to understand the vocabulary. 24% of the children were on track at the beginning of the year. 83% of the kids are at or above benchmark right now. I know. I was jumping up and down too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Our team really is amazing at Lou Wallace, and they are working very, very hard. Um, so I'd encourage you to uh, come and see some of that great work. Um, at the middle of the year this, this year, in Christmas, the district had outlined goals for us in Dibbles and TRC. We had actually already exceeded those end of year goals at the middle of this year. So we knew we were on track for end of year, and we're certainly going to exceed those uh, goals uh, as we already have, and then now we're surpassing our own goals. Everybody at Lou Wallace would tell you our goals are 80%, and they know that, and now we're finally starting to achieve some of those goals. Uh, in 2016, we increased from a D to uh, a B school. Uh, we expect ourselves to be fully in the A or B range this year due to our growth. So shall be determined, right? <laughs> All right. We have a couple of goals um, happening at Lou Wallace. 58% of our children, this is our school and district goals for us. Again, as I mentioned, 80% is our goal. Um, and 76% of our children should pass I read three. 
this past year, the data that we have from this last school year, uh, showed our growth to be the highest in the bottom 25%. We received 108 growth points in the bottom 25% and 105 growth points in the bottom 25% for math. We have four instructional focuses that we believe are key and pivotal to our um, five-year turnaround at Lou Wallace. And as I mentioned, we're in year three. Those key changes are guided reading, math workshop, writer's workshop, and the culture and climate of the school. Within each one of those, they're very important, but I'll share with you some partnerships and things we've done to each of those. Culture and climate has probably been the most um, visible change in the building and the attitudes of the scholars from their individual data tracking that they've been doing with their data folders and their excitement to share in their growth. One other piece that's received some recognition at Lou Wallace recently in the Chalkbeat article was um, the Opportunity Culture Partnership. When I came into the district, I was fortunate to be asked to be a part of Opportunity Culture. Our school is in its third year with Opportunity Culture. Um, we were recognized um, by the Indy Channel and Chalkbeat for the high teacher retention rate and for the work we're doing to create career ladders for our teachers. Um, and so I'll share with you a little bit about what that model looks like for us. In the 2018-19 school year upcoming, we will have four multi-classroom leaders. Multi-classroom leader is similar to an instructional coach, except they have a much higher rate of accountability than a traditional instructional coach. A multi-classroom leader is responsible in their evaluation for all of the data of the teachers they serve. So as a multi-classroom leader of grades three and four, I only do as well as my teachers do in the classroom and as well as my students do. That added accountability really drives the involvement of that um, instructional coach or multi-classroom leader and helps to drive the um, scores. The second piece of the multi-classroom leader model is that these are highly effective teachers, people who are proven to show exceptional results and they work with the teachers to both build capacity as well as expand their reach to more children in the school. You all know you've probably had children of your own where they may have had one great teacher and you thought, I wish every year could be just like that year. And the goal of Opportunity Culture is to expand the reach of these great teachers so that they can touch more children than just their one classroom. Um, we'll also have seven REACH associates next year. Those REACH associates are similar to instructional assistants, except they have specialized training in the areas in which we want them to focus and they support our multi-classroom leaders. Um, also, the collaborative and distributive leadership at Lou Wallace is very evident. Um, I am blessed and fortunate to have two assistant principals and three multi-classroom leaders this year. So there are six of us leading that team, and all of us are working with students uh, in some form or another, whether that be in small group instruction or intervention groups throughout the day. So I mentioned to you briefly the role of an instructional or a multi-classroom leader. These are kind of the four pivotal things that they do. They support students and teachers through co-teaching in the classroom, through small group instruction. They also um, do data analysis with teachers. They lead professional learning communities. They do lesson planning and unit planning with the teachers. So you have this exceptional teacher who is helping to build that capacity of other teachers. One of the other things that we're most proud of at Lou Wallace, if you have a chance to visit us, is our reading room. We actually have um, four individuals in a classroom, and those individuals' jobs are to reach out to our kindergarten, first, and second grade students every day. So those four individuals go to one teacher's classroom for 30 minutes a day, five days a week, to focus on small group reading. The children in those classrooms uh, get anywhere from four to five children in a group, and they get to work um, every single day right at their level, and we attribute that to some of the growth that we've seen. We're fortunate with these REACH associates next year that we can expand that all the way up to kindergarten through sixth grade. So everybody will get that advantage of 30 minutes of small group literacy every day on top of their 90 minute reading block. Some of the partnerships that we have worked with through our culture and climate this year um, have been the Peace Learning Center. That's probably been one of our best partners. They have come out to do mindful moments. If you've been to Lou Wallace or heard about Lou Wallace, every uh, morning and afternoon there's an announcement. You're asked to stop. Close your eyes, take deep breaths in through your nose and mouth for 90 seconds, and music comes across the intercom. It's really amazing to see a building of motion of 610 children and 56 staff members literally freeze and just take deep breaths and put themselves back in the right frame of mind. It's done wonders for the uh, behaviors of our students and for the peace of mind for our staff members as well. 
Um, and Peace Learning Center has also done uh, peace mentors with our children. So we actually have an entire group of peace mentors and peer mediators who facilitate conflict and conflict resolution. We partnered with uh, Playworks as well. We have a full-time Playworks coach at Lou Wallace. We're in our second year of Playworks. Um, the Playworks coach focuses on positive play and engagement of play with both the teachers and the staff with the students during recess, as well as um, interactive and engaging play for everyone. So nobody gets left out on the side when you're picking teams. Everybody's included in the play, and everybody gets to play more frequently because there's often seven or eight games on the playground happening at one time, and kids aren't just stuck waiting on a piece of play equipment. So it's been a really great partnership for us. We've seen our um, recess uh, discipline instance uh, actually go down by threefold. So it's really improved our recess uh, behaviors and incidents that happen there. Uh, we also do morning meetings every day and we're participating in the Brain Institute um, through a partnership with IPS and Dr. Laurie at Butler University. And every single quarter, uh, we recognize our students with excellence awards and convocations. Uh, that has done a lot to improve the culture of our school. And one of our uh, children's favorite things is excellence awards. They're recognized every day. Their teacher gives them an excellence award. They come down and they get a token and it looks like a little vending machine with toys and they get to actually buy a to toy out of the treasure tower. I'm sure that the kids would tell you they love it because we have at least 20 kids a day that we recognize for good things, for showing excellence in their attitude and their actions and their achievements. So where do we go next year and how do we continue to show growth? Because we're not done by any means. We're seeing growth, but we certainly want to achieve high performance as well as high growth. Uh, next year, we're going to focus on a school-wide math workshop. Um, and so we're embedding that. We've been working very hard with our EL team, as you can imagine, with over 250 language learners in our school. And as I mentioned, over 27 languages. We have a lot of work to do uh, in that department and supporting all of those children and families. Uh, and actually tonight, there's a large international fair. You'll probably see us on Twitter. If you want to see some pictures, we're recognizing all the 37 countries of our school. Uh, and then we will continue to work on writer's workshop and guided reading, which we know are critical elements. And our ultimate goal is to be the highest performing school on the west side of Indianapolis. You heard it here. I made it public, so that means we have to do it. And we will. I would open it up if anybody has questions or comments for me. I'd be happy to answer. Commissioner Sullivan first. Um, yes, this is really exciting. Um, I have a quick question about your partnerships. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you budget for some of the partnership programs? A combination of grants and different things piece it, that together, or is that part is. of your responsibility with the budget? So I love SBA, first of all. Thank you, Dr. Faraby, because it does give us the ability to plan for those. Um, so through SBA funding, through title funding, um, through some external grant partnerships, the IU Health Foundation the past couple years has helped us with the Playworks uh, Peace. Uh, Peace Learning Center also has some external grants where they're able to help partner with us. And then, um, of course, IUPY and their student teaching program is of no cost to us, so we're able to get over 30 adults to help work with our kids who are highly skilled and trained without any cost. And so some of it is through creative partnerships that way. Um, I yeah. really applaud you for um, how strategic your partnerships are in supporting and reinforcing everything that's going on with thank your you. pillars. So that's it's wonderful. Thanks. Our team works hard, so thank you. Um, I, I'm just sort of bowled over, and you know, I, I kind of want to be a student in your building. Come on over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but tell me about um, music and art and some of those. Um, um, curricular activities and how you incorporate that and how sure. you've been able to kind of hold on to those because I know there's always concerns that when we have to cut budgets that sometimes music and art and physical it's education true. are the first to go. So talk a little bit about how that works in your building and, um, and you know, the library and just those kinds Happy of things. Happy to. So we're really fortunate that we've not had to make any of those cuts. Um, my very first year when I came in, we had to think strategically, this was prior to SBA budgeting, and so how do you how do you make all of these great things happen that you need to happen within the confines you have? And so um, Dr. Pratt was very gracious to support me when I said I'd really like to consider trading in full-time music art and PE positions to do half-time so we don't reduce anything from our students uh, because we only have 363 kids, so really to meet the needs of students every week and seeing music and art and PE, I'd like to go um, half time and use those dollars. And so the very first year we did that. Since we've grown, we've actually added all of those back in. We're back to full time music, art, PE, library, and media specialist. Um, I'm happy to announce that next year we're adding in 
a media specialist again. We've had a media assistant for a couple of years, and so we're adding a media specialist back in. Um, as a music teacher, I understand the importance of the arts, and so we work really hard to advocate through groups like Kids Dance Outreach, um, the um, Art with a Heart, and other groups that we've brought in as well. And we try to do some after-school clubs with our art teacher. Um, we're doing a music ensemble of African drumming with uh, myself leading that, and so we're doing some fun things for the arts as well. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Moore. Yes, I wanted to also congratulate you on everything that you had to say. I could feel your enthusiasm, you know. Thank you. <laughs> and, and it really makes me feel good. I have a couple questions. What is your average class size? So we average anywhere between 24 and 28. I have a couple that have bubbled large, but our mobility is incredibly high. Uh, we have about 360 students who started with us and have ended the year, and the others are new. So over 1,000 children have enrolled at Lew Wallace just this school year. And so I think I heard you say that the reason why you were able to get the additional leadership in your school and the MCLs is because of the fact that you had a relationship with IUPUI and you get the additional instruction from them. Is that correct? That is true. And are you in an autonomy school? Uh, we're not in an autonomy school. We're part of the transformation zone, which I feel does allow us some autonomy, I will say. Commissioner Boyd, or more. Boyd. Amy, thank you so much for being here. It was great to listen Thanks. to you and your report about the school. Um, one of the things that struck me and that I had read prior was your retaining of teachers in this climate of where we know uh, we lose teachers. Can you kind of, uh, and I think you said 97%, can you give a secret? Or can you share it with me? <laughs> I don't you know if it's a secret. <laughs> I think the teachers, the, the teachers would say that that leadership team that we've built appreciate them and share respect for them and support them wherever we can. I think that's really important. We have to tell our great teachers how valued they are and tell them that we're invested in them. I think the second piece and the piece that Chalkbeat alluded to was because we have multiple multi-classroom leaders, they are supporting approximately six teachers per lead teacher. So they are right there with them in the classroom. They go in knowing a multi-classroom leader is not my judge, they are not my evaluator, they are a co-teacher on my team. So I have six teachers and I just happen to be kind of the lead teacher, the multi-classroom leader. And because of that, they feel incredibly supported. So I know, for example, this year, um, some of my brand new teachers, when they experience the challenges that come from working with seven different languages in your classroom and five or six kind of high needs behavior students, that they were ready to go in October. But because they had the multi-classroom leaders supporting them, because my two assistant principals and myself were in their classrooms providing them lots of feedback, support, encouraging them that it would be okay. Um, when you come to Lou Wallace, you see notes of encouragement. Uh, we joke because even in the restroom, there's little sticky notes that you can leave somebody a note of encouragement. And those little things add up to make you feel appreciated at the place where you work. So I think the number one is appreciation for the hard work they do. And number two is giving them the support they need, which is what we have found to be successful through our multi-culture, multi-classroom leader model. And just add additional context on the opportunity culture model that produces the MCL leadership and the distributed leadership that's taking place at Lou Wallace. Schools can volunteer to be a part of the opportunity culture model. Uh, some of the transformation zone schools were given more encouragement to do so, uh, but you spend a year planning out how you will distribute leadership across the building and provide these expanded roles for exceptional teachers prior to implementation. And the goal in that process is to do it in such a way that is cost neutral, leveraging the student base allocation dollars that the school is currently receiving. And so uh, as a part of that process, uh, the model is created, the leaders are identified, and then they go into implementation the following school year. And we're in, I believe, our third cohort of um, opportunity culture schools and schools that have volunteered to be a part of that process. Commissioner Hoops. Congratulations on your remarkable results to you and your team. Thank you. Uh, I was looking at your numbers. You were saying in 2015, 363, and then in 2017, 200, 610 students. What, talk a little bit about that significant growth. What are it was you a big growth for a yeah. small school principal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was a big learning year for me as well. 
Um, so I will attribute, we've attributed it to two factors because we did the study too and obviously um, Mr. Harrell and the Office of Enrollment have looked closely at this as well. Uh, there are two factors that we think really played into this number. Uh, number one, um, we used to support language learners at satellite schools. Um, we used to support them at Meredith Nicholson School 96. Uh, and then we would also uh, send our families to Carl Wilde School 79. And that was about four years ago that that was happening. Um, the ESL department um, decided that we needed to support our students in their home boundary or neighborhood school, which makes sense because that's the closest school you live to. And so they phased in a, pro a process where all of the children who were being served who had not exited out of ESL services would come back to the boundary schools. So that first year we saw a very large influx of students coming back that really were within the neighborhood of School 107's boundary, um, but may have been att attending another school. The second factor is there's a very large apartment complex near us, the Villa de Sol apartment complexes, that just recently renovated their complex and reopened multiple facilities within that um, complex. And as a result, they've moved in a lot of new families. And so we think those two factors have increased some of the growth there at Lou Wallace. We feel like we're start of, sort of starting to level out a little bit and then that first big wave um, of students kind of is over and now we're just kind of slowly adding. Um, it is very much uh, revolving. We, we've enrolled six children this week, um, so we just kind of continue to enroll students. I'm familiar with that area and know that it's a real salad bowl of different nationalities we love it. and ethnicities. And I also know that there's some different things, international marketplace and some nonprofits and, and business alliances that uh, are visible and active in there. Can you talk about, I'm assuming the school somehow relates or uses those resources or somehow you help each other out. Can you talk a little bit about that? We, we do. So it's actually an area of growth for us. Um, always kind of on the forefront was how can we leverage some of those partners. So we reached out to the mayor's office and their liaisons um, to connect us with some of the groups there. And we're slowly starting in year four to really build those partnerships. So my two assistant principals and I have a large uh, plan this summer to actually engage more of those partners. Um, I felt like our first two years in particular were really focused on kind of right siding our, our direction that we wanted to go in the school. And now in, as we go into year four, that's actually a new frontier for us that we can't wait to get started on. Have you on. worked at all with the Immigrant Welcome Center? We have reached out to them and they actually helped us some with our international um, festival this evening. Um, we do actually have almost 100 uh, refugees in our school. And so we have quite a few. And so we have partnered with them and they've provided some great resources as I well know, as Exodus and Catholic Charities. Right. And I know that their premise is to train people who live in neighborhoods to kind of be the go-to. Yes. I know a lot of these families have lots of barriers to other than language. True. I mean, their, their language is certainly about a, a barrier, but all kinds of other things. So that's a great group. And it's we would welcome any work. other resources that you all are familiar with because that is very much a direction we're headed in this year. And so anything that you could share with us, I would welcome. Thanks. I'm interested in learning what kind of strategies you're using. You mentioned the high mobility. Uh, what are some of the approaches that you've taken? So we do that? a great deal of connection with our families when they come in and getting to know each of the kids. And we also do a ton of small group instruction at Lou Wallace. So um, I, I would say through both math, guided reading, literacy instruction, and in writer's workshop, kids are continually put into uh, small groups to work, and that helps us to really accelerate growth for them. Um, our goal is a year and a half's growth for every child that comes in our door, kind of no matter where they start. And so that's what we're, that's what we're trying to accomplish. I, I think I wanted to direct the question to Dr. Kirby as well as you. But we hear a lot of charter. Could you explain transformation zone for those who might not have heard that quite a bit? Great question. Thank you for asking. Uh, as a part of the district's proactive efforts for intervening in schools that were chronically low performing, we made a request to the Indiana Department of Education to create what we call a transformation zone, which would be the district strategy of intervening in lieu of state intervention. And so we've had the ability to receive some state dollars to support the transformation zone along with 
our district resources to provide targeted support for our schools that have been struggling with student achievement. Uh, Lou Wallace was at one point one of those schools that was struggling with student achievement and through the efforts there under Jeremy leadership and his team, we've seen improvements in student performance as we've seen in other transformations all schools, uh, but we still have not um, you know, gotten to a point where we can run a victory lap. There's still a lot of work to do in those schools and they're struggling. We also uh, clustered the schools by the um, feeder pattern in terms of their feeding into either middle schools or high schools that were also struggling with student achievement. Knowing that struggling high school or struggling middle school doesn't have those challenges overnight that we needed to ensure that those elementary schools were providing students with the prerequisite skills to be successful when they get to middle school and then to high school. Uh, so it's, it's been a strategy that uh, we've gotten some positive feedback from, from the Indiana Department of Education. I also think it has been a successful effort in um, the district being more proactive and there's less state intervention in our schools that have been challenged with low achievement. How many do we have in IPS? It, it is it is a it is a fluid number, and we we have grappled with you know what is the right time for a school to exit out of the transformation zone, and then you know how much support it will continue to provide. I'll turn it to Ms. Johnson. Uh, she may have the numbers offhand. I also know that Dr. Pratt also supports the transformation zone, so he may be able to to provide that if Ms. Johnson is not able to. Uh, we're planning for next year, so I can tell you we anticipate having eight schools in the transformation zone for the 18-19 school year. I think we're at six now, am I correct? Five now. Hey, I just, I, I did, I, you may have said this earlier and I didn't hear. How long have you been at um, Lou Wallace? Third year at Lou Wallace. Oh, third year, okay. Uh -huh. This is my 13th year as a principal, uh, okay. 18th year in education. So um, I'm always curious, how long do you, I mean, because three years you've been able to build, a, I mean, do you think it's taking you I mean, I, I'm always curious on a part of a principal how long it takes to really build a, a culture in a building. I mean, it sounds like you've got a really good, cohesive team, and it's a you know, and it's a big building. It is. And, you know, um, I mean, how long does it usually take a principal to to build that kind of um, culture? This is in my building? third school to operate as principal. And in my experience, even though I don't like to admit that it actually does take what all the researchers say it does, which is approximately five years to truly turn a ship, um, it really does take at least five years. And uh, I would love to do it faster. I'd love to be there now. And I like Dr. Farab Farabee's word of we're not running a victory lap because we're not. While I'm excited about the growth and I'm optimistic to be our cheerleader and be up here celebrating our good work, we do still have room to grow. And I feel like it will definitely be um, another year to two years before I really feel like we're kind of right where we want to be and where I feel like our team is where we want to be. You know, this is the first year where almost everyone in the building is incredibly proud of kind of the work that we're doing. And so that moves into everybody else being more motivated to take leadership and to help move the, the direction that we need to go. So I, I think at least five years to really get a school to where you need it to be. Um, that's challenging because we all want it to be faster. Our kids deserve the best right now, and that's what we try to offer every day is the very best that they can receive when they come in our classrooms. I just said that, you know, I'm bragging on Jeremy a little bit. I uh, hope that's okay, sir. Uh, but, you know, I think as you heard tonight, I would add that that process, you have to have this continuous effort around recognition, celebrations, and acknowledgement because it is heavy lifting uh, to, to do school turnaround and to try to do it faster. And I think Jeremy has been very masterful in ensuring that that takes place on this campus. Uh, and we have encouraged him to share some of those best practices with other principals across the district. Uh, because you, you can, um, you know, get discouraged at times. And I think he's done a great job with ensuring that that doesn't happen. and the consistency and continuity and having the same staff, having the same leadership is also paramount as you think about um, the turnaround performance in a school that has been challenged with student achievement. So we're really fortunate to have you and really pleased
pleased with what we're seeing in terms of you just keeping the ball moving, and we know you'll get there, sir. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to say th thank you as well. I mean, it just I can hear the enthusiasm in your voice, and for the people that you know work for you, as well as the you know your team, as you call them, and as well as the students. And so you know, I, it has to be challenging when you look at the. Um, I mean, it's something to celebrate and challenging at the same time. I didn't get gray overnight, yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> 27 languages in 37 countries. Um, it's amazing. Countries. I mean, it's, it, it is amazing. It's pretty so, awe-inspiring, though, yeah. to be in an environment where everybody truly celebrates the diversity of mm -hmm. the school. Um, and it's pretty amazing to see how welcome the families and kids feel and how much they welcome each other. So. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming and bragging to us tonight. Thank you. Commissioner Moore has one more question. I have one more question. So you yes. said you've been a principal for 13 years. Yes, ma'am. Have you... Uh, been a part of IPS all 13 years, or did you just recently come on board three years ago? Newer to the team. Three years ago, I came on board. Um, I, I believe in serving our kids, and I absolutely love urban education and feel like I found my niche uh, here. And so um, just three years ago is when I came into IPS. Okay, one, one more. I promise. I said, sure. I said last. No problem. No, no direct question, but was, were you here in Indianapolis prior to going No to problem, Sherry. I actually was the founding principal of the Phelan Leadership Academies just up the street here at 23rd in Illinois with uh, Mr. Phelan. And uh, I served two and a half years uh, with him um, and then really missed our uh, traditional public ed uh, sector. And so decided to come here uh, and do some great work at Lou Wallace, saw a need. Um, I live on the west side. I live very close to that community. Grew up with the Lafayette Square Mall and neighborhood kind of being my neighborhood. And so I appreciate that community and want to make change there. Um, and actually, prior to that, I was a principal in a very small rural school district um, to the west of the airport uh, in the Mill Creek Community School Corporation. Well, we're glad to have you aboard. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, the next report on the uh, superintendent report agenda is an update on the Indigo pilot uh, serving high school students, particularly with a focus uh, beginning on Short Ridge High School. In your materials, you will see a interim progress report. Uh, and it's important to note that this pilot began on May 1st, previously presented to commissioners at a work session. Uh, support was provided and uh, we were given the green light to proceed with this pilot. We provide data on uh, trips and also the overall perceptions of students and their experience with riding Indigo to school. We have Manny Mendez, our transportation director, who can provide uh, more details about what's taking place to date. It's also important to note that given some of the success that we've seen with this pilot, we are interested in expanding the pilot to another site. Uh, where a high school has been identified that could potentially be served by Indigo Transportation. So with that, I'll stop there. And Manny, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, just want to give you a quick update. The pilot is moving forward well. We're seeing great return uh, from the children's survey. So I think we've, we've got a good thing going, and we would like to expand out into Arsenal Tech. Uh, I have 100 bus passes, and I would appreciate the opportunity to give that, uh, give, that a sh give our pilot a shot out up over there. Uh, I've spoken to Principal Lloyd. Um, he's in favor. Uh, so we are looking forward to that next step in, in this pilot. I can't tell you how excited I am at this. I mean, this is, I, I just really appreciate all your efforts. And really, she's excited, effort. by the way. I mean, I like, huh? Yes, you are excited. I know, I am just really, I mean, I could dance on this desk right now, but that would not be awkward. Um, I know when we had the briefing with Indigo um, about potential expansion down the road, they mentioned that tech um, had, um, some capacity issues and so have they been able to um, increase the capacity there or is this just going to be sort of for some students and yeah so a little bit about that tech has uh, three stops that service that area mm 
-hmm. So the, the indigo stops that we're looking at, you have a 15 minute turnaround time, you have a 20 minute turnaround time and a 30 minute turnaround time from their routes. So we believe that should be more than adequate to be able to um, take on the 100 students that we're looking at uh, offering it out. Okay. Uh, we also have the trip planner. So the children will be able to see where to take their, their routes that are appropriate and the timing. So I think we're gonna be okay with the service level. Great. How many of the, are these 100 students um, on a direct route or will they be transferring downtown? Um, we're working through those that. details to make okay. sure. So we have, uh, like we did with Short Ridge, we have the children mapped, and then we have the overlay of the routes. So we, we have good areas in which we would say these would be the better students that kind of fit that ride um, path. So that's how we're going to go through. Um, but we really have a good opportunity, really, no matter where they live. Um, right. Right. You know, it, it, it can work out. Yeah. Uh, no, the timing I, looks with three stops. I, I think we're going to have more than enough. Uh, well, and, and I think that is, if I recall correctly, the Indigo folks thought that, um, pardon, that, the, oh, well, that, um, that they would have that capacity down the road, that that was the one that had the least capacity compared to the other high schools. But I'm just, I'm, I'm really very excited. I, think, I can't thank you enough for um, you know, working through this and managing the pilots. Um, I just, you know, I think that we can't duplicate services in government. And I think this is a real win-win you know, um, for you know, students and taxpayers and Indigo and IPS. I just really appreciate your work on this. Well, it's a, it's a good shout out to the Short Ridge um, children as well as their administration. Uh, everyone's working forward. So we've been very happy. No negative reports uh, from both sides of the fence, uh, the Indigo and their patrons, and as well as our students. Thank you. Commissioner Gore, you have a question? Again, and thank you so much for your work and working with Indigo. I do see that total responses were 224. Is that the total number of students there at Short Ridge we're using, or was that just? That was our survey results, and um, the surveys are still out, so there's constant update. So what we want is the children to feel free to, to just hit that multiple times and, and keep giving us feedback. Um, there's over, at, at the time of this report, there were um, just about 80 um, passes issued, and of course there's been more. Um, they have passes that were issued that they, the kids haven't used them yet, but I'm getting my updated usage reports, so I should see, um, you know, again, an uptick in the usage. So uh, there should be a pretty good. Are we getting more good. children or more yes. students that yes. want to? Yes, yes. Um, Principal Shane had a uh, some sessions, small sessions with smaller groups on the children that hadn't used it, and you know, finding out why. So what was your fear or what was holding you back? Um, so that should show some yield once we get our updated uh, reports. Did we take a survey at Tech to find out whether or not how many students are interested there? Um, actually, it was the rumor mill that, that kind of got us thinking about Tech. Um, I, I, you know, we hear a lot from the students. So, you know, well, why didn't we get it? So I, I approached uh, Principal Lloyd and just said, well, are you palatable to it? Are you, do you think we can do this? And he's been great. So uh, we're going to take the next steps if approved. And uh, I'm going to be hightailing it over there tomorrow <laughs> if you guys say yes. Do, do you know um, roughly how many students per day are availing themselves of this opportunity at Short Ridge? Um, I, was I looking think at the numbers I'm trying to get. Yeah, it's. This and I can't figure it out, but. I, I think we're getting just about um, 65 to 70 every day. Um, and what's, what's interesting about the, the usage. Is that, is that trips or is that, is that individual? Trips? That's individuals, individuals. But the trip number is really high. Um, so they take a minimum twice a day mm -hmm. home. But they're using it for after school activities as well. Go home, come back to the school. So we're seeing a high um, hit at the stops that are at Shortridge. But we're also seeing usage on the weekends too. 
Um, so you figure if there's uh, students that have jobs, they're using it for the jobs. This is um, really a great opportunity to, to expand public, public transit and, and get our next generation of users. You, uh, no, Commissioner well, Sullivan. Yeah, I was just going to say, so Dr. Faraby, so are you, looking, are you just looking for some consensus this evening, not an official vote, but consensus? Yes, just to, consensus to, to explore expanding at um, Arsenal Tech, <laughs> and if commissioners are supportive, that's the consensus. We'll move forward accordingly, and then as we've done with this interim report, we'll come back with additional information on what we've seen at Short Ridge and then how it's playing out at Arsenal Tech. Commissioner Bentley, do you have Jeff? <laughs> I think we have Thank a sense you. of moving forward. All Thank right. You. Outstanding. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Commissioner, the next report is item 6.03, which is a, an update on high school policy and guidelines. Uh, you recall at our work session, we had an opportunity to hear from Principal O'Day at Short Ridge High School, uh, Principal Stan Law currently at Arlington and George Washington High School next year, and then Lisa Brenner provided an update on uh, policy recommendations associated with grading, and we have those uh, recommendations in the action session, uh, action portion of the agenda, I should say. And so if commissioners would like an overview again of what's being proposed for tonight's meeting. Uh, I see Principal Law here this evening, and we also have Lisa Brenner, our student services uh, officer, who can provide um, a presentation or overview, if you'd like, of what's being proposed as relates to uniform and standard mode of dress, and then also uh, grading. They got an overview. All right. No. So, principals. Great detail. You've got all So, so got. Um, Adjoining principal law is Principal Lord Bryant, who is principal at Arsenal Tech High School. So welcome, gentlemen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm a stand-in for Shane today. So um, this is what we do for each other. We step in at uh, the time of need. So, uh, so the standard mode of dress uh, obviously is aligned to the current dress code that we have in place. And it is something that when we started collaborating and planning about how this would look for us in the future, uh, we thought about the financial means of our families that we support. Um, and so with that, it retains the purpose of the dress code. It allows for equitable expectations across the city. Uh, and it also uh, assists families. They won't have to go out and purchase uh, all new colors based off the school that their children have, have selected. Uh, and I, we felt as though that was a very important entity in this uh, new proposal that we're bringing to you today. Um, so again, this will promote reinventing high school. It will create a sense of responsibility for students. And again, it's more aligned to the post-secondary world. Obviously, we know that when students go into the workforce, they may have to wear uniforms or a certain type of dress in order to be professionally appropriate. And for this reason, we wanted to make sure that we are aligned to the three E's and preparing our students for college and career as they move forward. Um, also, uh, it's inclusive uh, specifically for those uh, with an alma mater that is closed. So I know I will be getting an influx. I'll make it personal to me. I know I'll get an influx of students from across the city those students may have wore orange and black. Those students may have worn green or the red and blue of John Marshall. But I just want to welcome all students into the environment. And hopefully it will not, it will be cost effective for families as we go forward. Then minus the jeans and the leggings piece, which we know is a huge issue across the board for all of us. We'll still keep the same belt, et cetera, for students. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that it was financial friend financially friendly uh, for families. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Law at this time. Good evening, Board of Commissioners. Dr. Farabee. Um, picking up where Principal uh, Shane O'Day left off, I want to uh, sort of go over a couple of points, but I want to make a point about the dress code and as a principal and the time, a lot of time that we spend on 
um, dealing with dress code issues uh, in the school given the current policy. And so this is some of the conversation that went into uh, the principals well over a year ago to get together and, set, and come up with a, a viable model to present to you as a proposal uh, for change. And so um, just a lot of time spent on non-instructional issues and, and it turns into a lot of kids missing out on instructional time. Um, that be it, they may have to be out of classroom to wait for a parent to bring them more clothes in which that may or may not change. But also, um, it uh, sometimes it leads to suspension, which we know that does not uh, help at all. We only shoots ourselves in the foot. So with the standard mode address, um, as we call it, I hope I can get back to my, well, I'll, I'll read from up here. Um, the current dress code, of course, is very linear. It has uh, very specific colors that each school must wear. Because the high schools are reinvented uh, for next year, uh, we wanted to expand on that and give the students more choice and option uh, in the type of clothes that they wear. And so we're still expecting them to wear certain types of colors, but we've expanded the, expanded the color wheel, so to speak. So students can wear the polo shirts or the collared Oxford type shirts uh, like I have on. Um, instead of just the uh, standard khaki, uh, blue khaki, tan or khaki, uh, navy, uh, black I should say, they can wear different colors uh, of the khaki type pants. And uh, we still require them to wear the belts as uh, Principal Lloyd stated. And we, st we don't require jeans uh, still, unless there's some specific event that's going on and the principal or the administration says, yes, you can wear jeans. So that doesn't change from uh, the current policy. And so um, also leggings, which is a big thing now that the young ladies like to wear the leggings uh, without anything over it. We are expecting them to, they can still wear them, but they have to be worn underneath um, a dress so they can't just be um, solo. Um, again, we address the sagging issue. The current policy addresses the sagging issue by expecting a belt. While students don't necessarily have to wear a belt, but their pants have to fit um, and not sag below the waist. So that's a... Um, an, al an allowance that we're allowing for that. And so in terms of monitoring, we're still going to have an eye, keep an eye on the uniform code, uh, dress code, uh, smart, I should say, standard mode address. We'll still keep a, a watchful eye on that. No sense in uh, passing anything. We're not going to stick to it. So when students fail to meet the policy, we still have that expectation that we will contact a parent, ask a parent to bring um, the change of clothes uh, up to the school, hopefully. We, that will reduce because they have so many options and greater responsibility. We hope that that number uh, would certainly be reduced in terms of keeping kids out of class for a while as they wait on their parent. Um, we've also talked about starting, not talked about, but decided on that we will start a what we call a smart closet, uh, which is where the schools, each school will have um, an array of dress uh, clothes that will uh, we can lend to a student in the event that they uh, need to be corrected. And so that could be run by uh, for us, we often say we'll have, have our, our life skill students run that. They do such a great job uh, helping out in those areas of our schools uh, right now. And of course, for those students who are currently, or oftenly, I should say, um, uh, not in, not in uh, compliance, those students we would certainly deal with with um, our student code of conduct and, and parent conferences uh, and the like. And so, um, getting information or communicating with parents, of course, we will use some of the current modalities that we use now, but we certainly want to include that, like our registration is very huge. When we sit down and talk with parents at the beginning of the school year or whenever they come in to enroll in our school, that will be a part of, of our conversation uh, with the parents. Uh, we want to include it in our handbook, of course, new student orientations again, and uh, we want to talk with Enroll Indy to when parents are speaking with Enroll Indy about what are the dress codes with the school that will certainly be um, included. So having said all that, we'll wrap up for, I am really sweating. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they got lights over here or not. But um, anyway, we um, uh, certainly want to, uh, how it all comes together again with the reinvented high schools, the alignment of the uh, post-secondary world, cost saving for parents, which is a huge uh, plus as well as the responsibility amongst the students, we believe that this proposal uh, to the board will certainly uh, enhance um, our ability to provide quality education for our kids without a lot of interruption for non-instructional purposes.
thank you for your presentation, and I think it's a great idea that the students don't have to get into buying new shirts and those kinds of things because it is cost effective. I, I see that um, any color khaki pants, shorts, what kind of shorts are we talking about? For girls or for guys, or do they have to be a certain length? Or what are we looking at? So the current dress code calls for a certain length of shorts. And so we're just talking similar to the color of khaki pants, it's also the khaki shorts that certainly come down at least the, um, to the, uh, the length of your fingertip. And so, but those two can be of any color as well. What about shoes? Are they wearing sneakers, house shoes? Or? Well, no, <laughs> that's a good question. We do the dress code. There, there are a lot of things in the current policy, the current dress code policy that will stay in place. There are a lot of restricted um, items that students can't wear, house shoes being one of them, for example. Bandanas of certain, certain types cannot be worn. Sunglasses, hats, hoodies in the building cannot be worn, et cetera. So a lot of things will stay in place. Really, it's just expansion of the type of shirt, collar. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be solid, but um, just an expansion of those colors and, and, uh, and patterns. And I like the fact that we're not going to deal with belts. Fit. Exactly, yes. I just want to congratulate you on coming to us with, a, I think, a, a proposal that really takes into account important criteria. We took a look at this, I think it was maybe last year, and you guys went back to the drawing board and worked together, and I thought you came up with a great policy that really takes our families and, and also into account the fact that we're bringing students together from different schools and Absolutely. being sensitive to that. So I think you guys did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want one quick question. Um, I know the, the success is, you know, and I know it's difficult, challenging with um, teenagers, you know, they want to express themselves. Um, but do you communicate with parents about, you know, sort of why we have a standard mode of dress and, and trying to get them on board with, um, you know, helping um, communicate with their students what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, you know, just to, you know, get that extra right. help. Do you want to address that? It's up to you. All right, I'll take it again. So, yes, all of the principals and the schools, for that matter, will address um, the, the why of a standard mode address or address code. Um, we certainly, we in our conversations as principals, we've talked about uh, making sure that we're preparing our students for really the real world. And you can't just go into a, a, a place of work or a place of business, uh, whether you're taking care of business or you're providing a business, you just can't go. So there's a certain type of way um, of doing things. So we have those conversations with them. We certainly want to, to um, eliminate the possibility of gang affiliation or representing some type of clique, neighborhood, or gang affiliation in our schools that make them more unsafe. Uh, for all, all students. So those kind of conversations we, we do have and we will continue to have with our parents. All right, well, thanks. And thank you for, I know it's been a lot of work and you guys seem like you've collaborated and come up with a good solution. And I'm glad we're you know, giving a little bit, little bit of leeway with our high school students. I think, you know, and they've been, they've been I think, <laughs> they've been in school and right. IPS probably since, they, since the dress code started. <laughs> You know, back when. So they're used to it. So now we're giving them a little um, freedom, and I think that's important to do too. You thank know, you. So, so thank you. Any other questions regarding standard mode of dress? All right. Thank, thank you. you. Nice work. Thank you. <laughs> we're not done. Commissioner, it's important to note that there is a Board policy recommendation for revision for board policy 5511 associated with this particular proposal and report that was presented tonight. This also includes a recommendation which will require policy revision on weighted grading, which is board policy 5421. Um, Ms. Brennan will speak to what's being recommended uh, at this time. So welcome, Lisa. Right. Good evening. Um, I don't, I'm getting them queued up. Well, I can go ahead. And, I can go ahead and speak to it. So um, along with the dress code and uh, as we're really getting close to our um, 
implementation of our Reinventing High Schools work. Um, we've also been reviewing our academic policies and guidelines, and we've really taken into consideration our student voice and our administrative voice. So we've had a great um, student advisory council this year that has really helped us dig into some of our policies and, and let us know how they feel. And they've provided us some great feedback and then also met with our principals to see you know, where we can come up with some common ground. Uh, the transition of moving to from seven to four high schools has also been a great part of uh, our consideration. And we've also taken quite a bit of time to review and research best practices in each of the areas. Um, give it up. All right, so currently, as you saw tonight, our high school seniors are recognized using the Valor Victorian and Salutatorian. Um, and, and it was really exciting, and we absolutely love that. That's one of my favorite times of year, only second to um, graduation. I, I, it's my favorite night of the year. Uh, but we really uh, would like to be able to expand that. The Victorian and the Salutatorian um, system really limits the ac uh, recognition of academic excellence to two students per school. Uh, negatively impacts student collaboration often, not always, but sometimes it can do that. And it's less equitable between schools, especially when we're bringing students from all over the district together. Um, and often adversely um, influences course selection. And that's probably the thing that I've seen the most in my career, where people or students that are really at a time where they should be exploring their interest and challenging themselves are often making decisions based on how that will affect their GPA and whether or not they'll be number one or number two in the class. And many times it's the arts that they'll put aside so that they can take the AP class with the higher weight. So we don't want that to um, negatively impact any of our students, especially with where we're moving with our high schools. We want them to explore all of their options. Uh, so what we're recommending is that we move to a Latin honors system. And um, this expands the recognition of students. It allows multiple students. So imagine, now I don't really know how we're going to host our Latin Honors evening, because I think we're going to be packed. But, um, but it really gives us an opportunity to celebrate a lot of our students and the academic excellence that they have achieved. Um, it broadens the spectrum of academic acknowledgement so that students in any pathway, as long as they've achieved that academic level, will be recognized. It increases equity across the district. And it really primes our students for collegiate distinction. So. What we are proposing, or what we're hoping to move towards, is the, um, the Latin honor system, which is cum laude, magna cum laude, summa cum laude. And what we, um, we had put examples when we shared this previously, but we've gone back, we've done a lot of work around that, really made sure that those were solid best practices, and we found that they were. We met with our principals and additional staff, and this is really what we're going to move forward with these grade point ranges. We feel like these are, these are solid um, across the nation. So additionally, we um, really looked at building consistency in our grade point calculations, which you have board policy 5421 um, to review tonight that really looks at our, adjust our steps within that policy. Um, we also are exploring class ranks, or we are will have those on the transcripts to ensure that even with moving to the Latin honors, that we still um, denote who is you know number one in the class and number two because there are scholarships that are surrounded around that, and we want to make sure, of course, that all of our students have opportunity to receive any scholarship that is available to them, um, and then we want to make sure that we are communicating this prior to the end of the school year. Any questions? No? Nope. Again, commissioners, the weighted grading system is a part of the board policy recommendations for board policy 5421. Commissioner. I just want to thank you for the work. I think it's a great uh, approach, and I'm glad we're adopting it. So thank you for all the legwork you've done. Mr. Lawless. <laughs> Commissioner, the next report 
is item 6.04, which is an overview of the construction projects for our high schools in preparation for the new high school experience beginning the 2018-19 school year. Scott Martin will provide an update on renderings of updates and what we're expecting in this new experience and then also provide some samples of where we are to date as it relates to making those updates. We also have highlighted here some of our partners. Uh, you recall that we're using the constructors, managed constructor, I believe, I think I got that right model, uh, to assist with expediting that effort. And then uh, core strategies, uh, Deb Koontz has worked with the district on a number of projects, uh, has assisted Scott with um, providing this renderings and then some of the photos that you'll see this evening. So with mm -hmm. that, I'll turn it over to you, Scott. Yeah, good evening. So continuing the theme of high school reinvention, we are in full swing at the four school sites uh, that will be high schools next year at, at, at Christmas Attics, Short Ridge, George Washington, and Arsenal Tech. And that all the work that we're doing right now is leading to more college and career options for students as well as 100% choice. One item that every high school will have is going to be uh, new for next year, and it's called a Future Center. And that Future Center will provide mentoring, uh, interview training, college admin support, and tutoring uh, for, for not just this year's students, but, but recent alumni as well. Even, even though it looks like they're all, they're all different, the space is different, but they all will have the same technology and support for students. So beginning at Arsenal Tech, this is uh, the Architecture Career Academy that's on the first floor of, of Lone Hall. And you can see that it's, uh, uh, it's a large, modern, uh, well-lit, uh, day-lit space that allows for a lot of student collaboration. Uh, one thing, one thing that, that you'll notice is the furniture that, that I'm going to show in every rendering is actually the furniture that's, that's going to be there. We were able to get that art and, and incorporate that. Uh, we had actually this space became, uh, for one day, was a furniture lab where, where students and staff were able to look at all the different vendors. And then, they were, then each principal was able to choose the type of furniture not just specific to their school, but specific to the program and the type of learning that was going to take place in that classroom. So they'll all be a little bit different. A couple similarities, but for the most part, they're all they're all different. This is the project lead the way. Uh, on the left hand side here is a, a lab space. Uh, behind this wall, sorry, behind this wall is typical classroom space. This is what the Career Academy uh, looks like currently, uh, before all the finishes are in. This is what it was uh, previously. You can see there was a lot of equipment. It was used kind of in a similar uh, fashion, but it was the construction uh, program that was located in this space. And now it's going to be a, a 21st century modern learning environment. Construction trades. Uh, dang. Okay, so this is uh, it's currently a audio or automotive shop. Uh, it's on the left-hand side. The equipment's been moved out, and we have a lab space here, and then we have, again, a, a typical classroom space uh, behind that wall. Project Lead the Way, uh, a little bit different than the rendering. Again, it, it, it was a, it's on first floor loan hall. Uh, we have... Uh, lab space here, and then you can see behind the windows, you can see the, the typical classroom space. At Christmas Attics, there are seven classrooms across three floors. They're going to have this same type of feel with this same furniture. Th this, is, this is currently the, uh, the health science space on the first floor. You can see that, that the furniture that was chosen uh, allows for individual work, as well as you can eat their mobile so you can group them for more collaborative work. The Teaching, Learning, and Leading Academy is on the first floor uh, down by the uh, dining hall. Uh, you can see that it's a more of a traditional seating here, uh, kind of collegiate. 
but it also has a table here that's called a nesting table. And it, it allows you either for individual or, or two people, or you can put them together to become e an even larger group for more collaboration. Uh, because of the increase of students at Christmas Attics, we, we had to be creative in how we incorporated learning space into the building. There was a, a space on the second and third floor that was three very large classrooms, about 1,300 square foot each. So what we were able to do was take, that, take those three and convert them into four classrooms to accommodate the larger student population. Uh, one thing that we did was look for a, a better way to incorporate the computer labs that were in the building. They, they were in, uh, in a very busy hallway, very loud. So we were able to take some space from the media center and provide a better, uh, more quiet area for student testing. Uh, by, this, the wall used to be there. Uh, that becomes actually a classroom and, and two computer labs. At George Washington, this is uh, three classrooms. Uh, this is representative of three classrooms. Uh, they're going to be on the first floor. This, again, they, they were able to choose their own furniture. Uh, it's, it's more of a collegiate style where, where there, there are rows of tables facing uh, the teaching space in, in the front. This is the Marketing Career Academy, the Advanced Manufacturing Logistics Academy. Uh, this is space that's adjacent to that, also on the first floor, currently uh, a storage room and, and another uh, space that it was not very well suited for learning. So this, if you see this gentleman right here, this is actually a glass wall. So if you keep your eye on him, you'll see it in a second. But th this is the classroom. And, the, and here's this gentleman here on the other side. So there's a glass wall that was put in between the classroom and the lab to make it seamless. The computer tech support is also on, on that first floor in, in that area. Uh, here's another example of the nesting tables. This particular uh, style of table has a whiteboard top. So students can do their work there on, on the table. And then uh, it actually shows you the larger configuration of three tables that are put together to accommodate more students for collaborative learning. On the third floor, is the, going to be the Freshman CTE Center. And currently, there's four classrooms, two on each corner and then on the northwest and the northeast corner. And we're, going to, we're taking those and making those into two large classrooms. That's the 21st uh, century modern learning environment where you have a typical classroom, but no wall, and, and then a collaborative space where students can break out and, and work in group projects. Uh, moving on to Short Ridge, so sound editing and TV is also part of the visual performing arts. That's going to be moving to Short Ridge. They didn't have spaces that would accommodate that. So on the third floor, this is the sound editing space. This room right here in the back is a sound editing room. The TV studio is, is an adjacent space. This is actually looking from the uh, control room. In, into the room that will be used as a, uh, as a TV studio. So th this is actually sound editing. You can see the framework for the uh, sound editing room in the back. And this is actually, this is actually the control room uh, that was separate from this learning space here. You can see it was kind of a catch-all. Uh, so we blew the wall out, and, and now that will be the control room for the TV studio. So with the, the increase of students also at Short Ridge, we had to be innovative in how we approached accommodating the number of students that we wanted to accommodate, as well as provide a good learning environment. So this is the cafeteria. Uh, right here is the dining room, and it, where you're, you're looking north towards the football field. So you have the columns that, that divide that space. So as we worked with Principal O'Day, we thought, you know, what could this space become? It's a large space, it's well lit, it's adjacent to a high student use area. So these are gonna be math classrooms. And 
with a glass wall that's going to demise it between the cafeteria provide and provide quiet between the, between the, the cafeteria and the math lab. So right, right now, that's just a framework. But that will be glass. And one, one thing that comes into mind you know, with the glass classrooms is student safety. So we provided a standalone secure room for students that for uh, intruder drills and, and other types of events, uh, storms, that, that they could actually take cover in this room and they also use it as a, as a training space. That, that's a block wall. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's a very safe space. And we, and we uh, designed it to hold 30 students. Uh, with the increase of, of students, when you combine both uh, the Broad Ripple and the Short Ridge band students, they needed more space. So this is currently on the first floor. Uh, this, this, this is your current band room. And we, we blew out the walls and expanded that into an adjoining room to, to get more space and a better, better layout of the, of the music program. Did the same thing in the orchestra. You can see it's, it, it, that's, this is the current choir room. Uh, you can see it's, it's a very small space, not very good acoustics. So again, we, we, had, we enlarged that space in, into an adjacent room to create a, a more conducive orchestra space. Choir is, is going to be next door to the orchestra space. This is uh, currently, well, that's what it is currently. This was the uh, former courtroom that, that is now located as part of the, the public law and policy that is over at Arsenal Tech High School. So this, this is what it is currently. It's becoming uh, a larger choir room. Uh, you know, we're talking about innovative space. So we were look. We needed. We needed some more classrooms. So there is a space that is adjacent to the auditorium and the stage, where was currently a, a pretty much unused uh, locker room. So we were able to to convert that into three classrooms. The first classroom is a keyboard and piano lab. Second one is a general classroom. The third one is a set design room that right here is an overhead door that so a, as students design the artwork and, and the sets, they can take them directly from that space through the wall and onto the stage. So we wanted, we wanted to incorporate as many things as we could to support uh, both IB and visual and performing arts. So I'll, I'll take any questions that you have. Commissioner Finley. I just have a, a quick couple questions. Um, they have a, a the, the, is there a Marley dance floor at Short Ridge or a dance lab? There, the, there, there is a dance, there is a current dance lab, yes. Oh, okay, so that that's yeah. already. Yes. Yeah. And then um, what about, um, I know at Broad Ripple there's, I think four, I could be wrong, um, private lesson rooms, you know, smaller practice rooms, mm -hmm. private lesson rooms where either students can go in individually yeah so you can see them in, in the back oh, okay uh, th that we've incorporated those in, into the into the space okay and there were some that we were able to leave uh, so, so they're they're winger sound labs they're, they're very they're very good very expensive we were able to to incorporate that into the design okay all right great thank you Commissioner mm -hmm. hoops uh, I wanted to get a general idea of what the square footage were for the Future centers, even with classes, I can't. Think yeah, very the, well, the, 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 <laughs> give me a general they're, sense of they're, what they're, the size. They're, so yeah, so they're all different depending on the space that was chosen mm -hmm. by the principal to accommodate that program. Um, I I'm gonna guess by by looking at them, uh, the, the, so they're all, they're all, they are to scale. Mm -hmm. So you can see that uh, Washington's is a, a lot more long linear. Uh, as as what you see, I'm sorry, as you see over here at uh, Christmas Attics. So they, they all have the same functions. Uh, they're, they're probably a minimum of 1,000 square thousand? feet, maybe okay. as large as 13 to 1,400 square feet. Thank you. Which is, you know, either a, a, is a little bit larger than a typical classroom or a classroom and a half. Commissioner Sullivan. Yeah, I just wanted to know real fast how you feel about timeline. Are you... 
Get a so little nervous? Or? <laughs> that was the first line I should have said. We're, yeah, we're, I think you should have <laughs> led with that. Let, let me start again. So we are on budget and, and on schedule at this at this point. That's a yes. good way to leave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we have ten weeks till school starts. We are we're going to be done in eight, and we have we have a lot of work to do. The principals have been uh, overwhelmingly uh, positive and supportive of of the of the process. We were able to move students around the different areas to get access. Uh, because we knew it was a short timeline. Uh, for example, at Christmas Attics, on those, those, those were used classrooms where, where there was four of them. You know, uh, it was going to be four, and then it was three. They were using those classrooms, but they had other rooms that we could use in the meantime. So actually, uh, four of those we've already completed and turned over uh, to the school and then moved down to the next floor. Commissioner Sullivan asked my question. Thank you very much. Great work. Yep, That's thank good. you. Great. Thank you, Scott. Commissioner, that concludes all of our staff reports for this evening. We have one item of unfinished business, which is item 7.01. It's a recommendation to enter into the proposed energy savings contract with Synergistics. We have provided additional documentation as requested on the due diligence associated with this proposed contract. We've also provided uh, additional information associated with the organization and also the agreement is in your materials. We're requesting that commissioners approve this item as presented to begin in June of 2018 with a five-year term. This was presented at a previous work session and also brought forth to commissioners last month as an action item. Do I have a motion to approve the energy saving contract as presented? So moved. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Commissioner, the next section is new business. The first item is 8.01. It's a recommendation for a sales agreement for the Meridian Transition property to Families First of Indiana. This property is located at 1840 North Meridian Street and was declared as surplus in December of 2017. We're asking that commissioners authorize resolution number 7785 associated with the sale of this property as presented. So moved. Do I have a, I have to ask for the motion. <laughs> Do I have a motion to approve resolution number 775 authorizing the sale as presented? We gotta get moved and seconded. Any discussion? Yeah. All those Excuse in me. favor? Excuse Aye. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'd like difficult. to be recused from this vote, please. Thank you. Duly noted. Uh, and, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. <laughs> commissioners, next item is item 8.02. Request that commissioners approve resolution number 7786 as presented for authorization of a right of way. Uh, easement for Short Ridge High School. This particular recommendation is being brought forward as we are expanding our transportation efforts at Short Ridge High School as the enrollment is expanding. Ask again that commissioners approve this right away as presented. Do I have a motion to approve resolution number 7786 authorizing the right of way grant and transportation easements as presented? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The, motion. the next item, Commissioner, is item 8.03. Uh, it's important to note that this is the item that required public hearing. It's a request for additional appropriations for the 2017-18 school year and fiscal year for additional revenue in alignment with projected expenditures. Do we have anyone in the audience who wishes to give public comment on the uh, Additional appropriation information. Mr. Grammel Spucker? Our public hearing already took place, so no, we have no sign ups on this particular item this evening. Do I have a motion to approve resolution number 3007 18 approving the additional appropriations as presented? So moved. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? Do you want to let Weston come up and explain? Do you want to uh, quick overview again? Weston? Give a quick overview again.
Is there a specific slide? And is it the general fund question, or do you want to go back farther? If you could just highlight for each account what's being requested and then the okay. reason associated with that request. Okay, great. Three funds, general fund, transportation, bus replacement. For the general fund, we're requesting an additional $12 million. Our original appropriation was $260 million. The projected expenditures for 1718 are around $269 million. Revised total appropriation will be $272 million. So the rationale behind the additional appropriation request, just back up of what an appropriation is, it's an authorization to spend. It's a legal authorization to spend. Appropriations are on the expenditure side. What, it dis what this allows us to do is if enrollment increases, when revenue increases, expenditures are also going to increase as well. So related to my comments on Tuesday, when we put the assumptions together for the original appropriation, that was back December, January of 2017. And at that time, took into account the number of students that would be coming in for revenue and what the expenditures were needed to address those numbers of students and the needs of those students. In March of 2017, that 260 million was approved. April and May, in come a couple of new agreements that were not known, not in place, and added students to the enrollment numbers that IPS would be accountable for and that IPS would receive money for. So I, I wanna emphasize we were gonna receive additional money for additional students, okay? Therefore, if we're getting the additional money, where is it going? It's gonna go above the original appropriated amount of $260 million. So therefore, receiving the additional money for the two new agreements, we actually dispersed that money over the course of this year. And so a portion of that $12 million is because of the additional enrollment we received and the additional expenditures related to that additional enrollment. Uh, I've also highlighted that at the time of the appropriation request for 260, the high school reinvention project was not, uh, uh, it wasn't out of the box, it wasn't uh, known exactly what that was going to be, but when it was adopted in September and we moved forward, we had met with our IEA and our teacher uh, union and agreed to incentivize and, and reward and, and, and show appreciation and loyalty to the high school staff who stay the entire school year of 2017-18. And so at the end of the school year, with HR and finance getting together, looking through you know, who, what, what's, what the staff members are eligible for that incentive, I have a reserve of about $2 million to be given out Again, timing-wise, it may not be paid out by June 30. But if it is, I need an appropriation for that unknown way back when in January 2017, March 2017, when we were putting together the budget. So that's, those are the two main uh, numbers. There's a lot of other numbers that are up and down, but if I were to say the two big buckets, uh, I would, I would uh, put, put it into the agreements and also the high school reinvention incentive payments. And then there's an additional amount for any unknowns that come in related to timing, about $3 million uh, that allows us to have uh, an additional appropriation of $12 million. So Wes, I think it's, just to see if I can translate to the O'Connor third grade level, the, the agreements have brought new students to the school system. Those new students bring state funding with them, per pupil funding. We can't spend money we haven't appropriated. So we have to appropriate the additional funds also. Correct, and, and there might, I just wanna make sure, there is state funding but there's the, the very well-observed, known student-per-pupil dollar, okay? Correct. Uh, there is also money that flows through IPS to those, uh, through, because of those agreements related to SPED. So if, if an agreement says we will uh, receive dollars and pass it on, that increases the dollar amount. If we get, if it's a high school, which in this case they were, high school honors, career vocational tech dollars, um, you know, additional items, summer school has come through. All of that adds up and we need that additional appropriation to send it out to our partner school because we've received it. 
and that's just the procedural aspect of uh, doing that at a school level or at a district level. If you remember back to, during the legislative session earlier this year, the state, so Indiana budget state, a, a, appropriated an amount, but when all of us districts, 289 districts, said here's how many people came in and were teaching, we need more money than what you appropriated. And so the entire legislative session, they were working for two months to say, well, you know, are we going to short all the school districts some money? Or are we going to find some dollars and do a procedural appropriation? And in that case, uh, you know, we did not see a reduction. No school district saw a reduction. But there was a procedural action that the district, the, the state was not going to be able to pay us unless they had the legal authorization. And that bill passed, thankfully. And none of us saw a reduction in our funding. So that, I just want to bring that level, that appropriation is both at the state level and also at the local school district level. Mr. Arnold. Can you discuss the relationship between this increase request and in innovation schools? Because I know that was brought up. I know it was said that one of the reasons we were asking for more had to do with more innovation schools. But my understanding is that the charters have through money from, it's not the same as our allocation. So can you clarify that? In most cases with the Charter Network Innovation Schools, it is related to a pass-through amount. In these arrangements, it was we get some money, but we were in uh, Heron and Riverside's case, we were getting less money, which we believed was an equitable share. And so Charter Network is typically a pass-through in, in general. So do we give them more since they, because I'm, I'm still confused. Whatever they're allocated from the state passes through have to go to those in, gen in general, the agreements for charter network schools is whatever we're getting from the state, we're passing along to them. So how does this increased request there were some there was some innovation schools that were added after this request was approved by board of commissioners and so once those schools were added that increased our revenue but also that increased our expenditure as we were pushing those dollars out to those schools accordingly so they're not getting additional money that, no. other, that our traditional schools aren't getting that is correct it's just at the time assumption that I'm hearing is people are believing that somehow because it was mentioned of innovation schools had a piece of this that somehow we're taking money away from all the other schools that we're, we're pushing to get more money. Right. This, this does not money. result in taking dollars away from any other school in the district. It doesn't impact our student base allocation. It doesn't impact any other school that would have had a pass through as well. Um, and I, you know, we have to go through this process because even though we got the money, it's we cannot spend it unless we authorize the administration to spend it in a specific way. And so that's what this public hearing is. I mean, we haven't sort of gone back to a taxpayer and asked them for additional funds. These are actual funds we have received from the state based on our per pupil um, formula. And it includes additional revenue we received because we entered into these agreements. But because we have expenses associated with those students and we didn't appropriate the money to, to pay for those expenses, that's why we have to go through this process. Correct. Okay. If we didn't go through this process, our finance team would be holding checks for both employees and vendors. And I don't think, Scott, we might not be on time. Mm -hmm. if <laughs> But the, the point, the point was we, we would have to wait till July 1st mm -hmm. to start spending an approved appropriation for the 18-19 school year to backfill what wasn't paid for the point, the point in time when we had to hold checks to not go over $260 million. Um, just one last thing. I, you know, I, I really appreciate the young gentleman that was here from Shortridge. You know, I appreciate and respect his advocacy. I'm sorry that he didn't stay at the meeting so he could maybe learn a little bit more about how government finance works. So, you know, maybe someone could reach out to that young man and, and, and you know, get, 
you know, I, I, cause I appreciate where he was coming from cause it is complicated. Um, and, you know, I know we have other people that um, are, you know, continue to be critical of the administration and um, our lack of transparency. And, you know, we had, we went through a lot of this information at the finance committee meeting. Unfortunately, you know, most people, a lot, most members of the community don't attend the finance committee meetings. And we do, you know, learn quite a bit at those meetings, actually. Um, so anyway, I, I appreciate, because I, sometimes I get confused, and so I appreciate, you know, you, um, def, um, you know, clarifying that we're not just talking about added expenditures, where it's associated with added revenue for those same students. So, thank you. Commissioner Sullivan had a question, I don't know if it's relevant. Yeah, it's, it actually wasn't a question, but I did want to just, uh, I do think this is really, really important that um, we do make this really clear to the public because we've been contacted by folks about it and that um, I think it's helpful to think sometimes as appropriation and as a permission, permission to spend and not new money. Um, so I, I just really appreciate your <laughs> patience with kind of trying to explain all of this to folks, but I think because the word is often used differently in not when you're not talking about budgets, that's what's confusing to folks. So I think if you just think about it, it's just permission to spend money that you already have, but you had not previously had given permission for them to spend. I'm just going to go back. I want to just highlight for the community, one of the reasons why we are talking about a $12 million additional appropriation is because IPS years ago would maybe ask for, hey, we have lots of plans. We may do them, we may not. But we're, to, we're gonna ask for an appropriation from the board to do it all. We wanna get the authorization to spend it if we have the funds. And so if we were in that, if we were three or four years back, I believe I wouldn't be sitting here out talking to you about the general fund. Okay. <laughs> but the reality is, if I, if I ask for, you know, hey, there's some big plans we have. We're doing high school reimension, all this stuff. We think we might have four more innovation schools that we added, whatever it is. I come in and ask you for $280 million at the beginning of a year, uh, we wouldn't have this $12 million conversation. But I, and I don't think that's as transparent as what the shift has been since Dr. Ferry's come on board, where we talk about, okay, this is our real expenditure. I mean, you, you've seen the assumptions way back when in 2017. Transparent about it. Here's what it is. I, I Things have what, changed. What Weston is highlighting is that in a time period where we had budgeted deficit, this has allowed for us to actually speak in real time. And so if we're speaking now a deficit, it's not what we think we might spend. It's a little bit more accurate than what we're actually spending. And then we're actually speaking of a structural deficit, not a budgeted deficit. And there were many times where decisions were made based on a budgeted deficit that included um, numbers that were really overstated in terms of what our potential expenditures would be, but we understand the reasoning on that. Um, when you do that, you don't have to go through this process and ask for permission, if you will, uh, to spend in those cases and uh, to highlight transparency, uh, as we've done in the past, and we will as we go into the 2018-19 school year, there is a detailed funding explanation on every school in the district regardless of type in terms of how they're funded. Uh, and we'll continue that effort to ensure that the community has a, a very um, explicit and specific view of how funding flows to the schools as we receive it from the state or receive federal or local dollars as well. I also want to highlight the transportation fund and the bus replacement fund. Last month we, we did some conversation about uh, transportation costs are projected. So our projected numbers were in the 46 to $47 million ranges. That's cut across both the transportation and bus replacement funds. If you add up the original budget of the appropriation for the transportation fund, it was a little over 30, $39 million. For bus replacement, our original ask was $12.5 million. So uh, our original budget was more than our expected projected expenditures of about 46 to 47 million dollars for this year. In the orange on the right of the transportation fund, the DLGF approved 22 million dollars initially 
we're coming back at this time in a procedural move to request the additional $17.8 million. Again, add those two appropriations together. It does not exceed the initial budgeted request uh, that, that we made in March of 2017. Similarly, the bus replacement fund in orange was the original appropriation approved by the DLGF. We're coming back for $1.6 million of additional appropriation request. Again, add those two appropriation requests up. It does not exceed the original budgeted amount that was approved by the board. So. Any questions? Commissioner Gore, does that answer your, was the background you were looking for? I wanted for the public as well to understand where we were and why we would approve yeah. what we did tonight. I just, I want to thank you, Weston, for, you know, walking us through this again. I think it's, you know, hopefully people are interested in the facts and will, um, you know, dig a little deeper into, um, you know, um, these numbers and, um, you know, if they're truly interested in helping the district and helping our students. So I appreciate your time and, and uh, walking us through this again. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. I just want to just appreciate commend you, too, because you address it so clearly, uh, walking us through. Really, I think it's important that we continue to revisit this because new families come along and it's new information. So. Uh, your patience is absolutely appreciated. Welcome. So we have had a motion in the second already, uh, and have had discussion now. Uh, all in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Commissioner, the next item is item 8.04 is request to approve a memorandum of understanding with Ivy Tech Community College to install diesel technology instructional equipment and to offer courses in the evening utilizing the technology. It's also important to note that Arsenal Tech Career Technology Center, where this will be located, will also have access to the diesel instructional equipment as well. We're asking commissioners to approve the memorandum of understanding as presented. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Commission's next item is 8.05. We previously discussed the recommendation from the high school principals that the administration supports as relates to dress code, requesting that commissioners approve the amended policy for board policy 5511 and ask that commissioners approve resolution number 7787 as presented. Yes. Uh, so in order to get this information to students families as soon as possible and update our website and student handbooks accordingly, I would ask for the board to consider waiving the 30 day period to approve the amending policy. Are there any concerns with this? So moved. Second. Second. We have a, uh, a motion to waive the 30 day period and uh, is, would you consider that motion approving resolution number 7787 amending the board policy in, in conjunction with that motion? Yes. Okay. So we're, we're both uh, waiving the 30 day period and approving the dress code policy. And moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Commission, next item is item 8.06, which is also associated with the weighted grading system and GPA uh, standardization that was previously presented, asking that commissioners approve the amended board policy 5421 and the associated resolution number 7788 as presented. So as, uh, as we did before, I'd similarly ask the board to consider waiving the 30-day period and then a motion to approve resolution number 7778. So moved. It has been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Commissioner, next item is item 8.07, request for commissioners to approve the proposed board policy 5620 associated with suicide awareness and prevention. It's important to note that recently passed legislation requires school boards to adopt a policy addressing student suicide prevention and awareness. Yeah, there's no action on 807 and 808 at this time. Both of these are going to remain on the table. For, so the two previous ones required action because of the time for high school, but these are going to lay on the table until June. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mulholland. Again, 
the same would apply as highlighted for item 8.08, .08, which includes updates to the human resource policy. Uh, administration has been working to update policies and consolidate, ensure that they're in alignment with current laws, uh, governor employment, and so we'll ask commissioners to take action in June. The last item for action is item 8.09, request for approval for additional pathway and course offerings associated with the Health Sciences Academy at Crispus Attics High School. We ask that commissioners approve these recommendations to be submitted to the Indiana Department of Education uh, so those courses can begin for the 2018-19 school year. Request that commissioners approve resolution number 7789 as presented. I have a motion to approve resolution number 7789 authorizing course waivers as presented. So moved. Second. A motion to second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Uh, we're at the point of closing comments. And Commissioner Bentley, I know you have oh. something. Uh, did I? I think I might have closed it and I apologize. Um, but so go, somebody else can go. Commissioner Sullivan. Yes, so um, if we can just do something real fast, um, I would really appreciate it. I recently attended uh, the math ceremony for math awards for the district at Tech High School. It was amazing. Um, it was on Monday, May 14th. And um, during this presentation, they tried something new, and they had some videos, uh, little vignettes of students talking about math. They had some interviews with some very interesting answers by our students. So um, I had asked staff if they could kind of throw together a really quick greatest hits of that video. So it's real short and I think it will make everyone really happy to see um, our math athletes and hear some of their advice for us. He still um, is able to teach me a lot of things inside and outside of the classrooms. And I wonder how he knows these things, but I mean, even then, he knows these things, and it's just, I've always looked up to him. I feel that learning math is important because it's like, it's, it's like in everything that you do. My parents don't help me with math. <laughs> <laughs> but if I had to say one thing, it would probably be they're not, their, hum uh, their humility and the fact that they know they're not good at math because then they can show me new resources to get there. They don't help me. I'm better at math than them. Just don't overthink it. Overthinking it is the worst thing you can do. Also, if you're a smart person, don't get cocky. Like, if you, if you think, if you're gonna be like, oh, this is way too easy, but then it ends up being hard, you'll be like kind of surprised. If they have a hard addition problem, they could count on their fingers, like if it's four plus five, they could do four plus five is nine. Don't give up. Show your work. Don't be intimidated by large numbers. I would probably have them perform a skit for me because I want to make sure that they can make math Engaging. Probably make sure that they can do math. <laughs> I would probably want to be a librarian because I could read all the books I want. I don't know. <laughs> a programmer because, well, I get to make video games. I guess the geometry. That's what I like most about math. I like dealing with shapes and 3D figures and stuff. I think about it for a while, like, just to make sure I'm not overthinking it. And then, if I still don't know, I ask for help. It was a great night, and uh, the parents really enjoyed um, seeing their kids up on the big screen with their surprising sometimes answers. Thank you. Um, I just I had the opportunity, and I think maybe some other commissioners went to the 25th anniversary celebration for the Center for Inquiry last Friday night at the Central Library. I want to congratulate mm -hmm. our Center for Inquiry uh, family for uh, 25 years of a um, teacher-created uh, uh, program. And um, let's, we'll hear, hear for the ne next 25 years. Um, also, I just, it was in our um, 
the personnel report that there was a memorial to a teacher that we lost last week. And I'm going to tear up, but anyway, um, I w um, so I wanted to read that um, just because this person I've known for years, she was a graduate from Broad Ripple High School, and um, I think she's been t taught in IPS, um, you know, for many, many years. Um, so I'm going to read the memorial. Uh, Whereas Para Gale, who died on May 8, 2018, served the Indianapolis Public Schools for 34 years, Whereas her years of service contributed positively and significantly to the Indianapolis Public School students. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of School Commissioners of the City of Indianapolis that the death of Para Gale be memorialized and that a um, copy of this memorial be sent to, to members of her family. Para Gale worked as a music teacher and was respected by students and staff at Charles Warren Fairbanks for her thoughtfulness and devotion for their well being. Her peers and supervisors respected her dedication to duty. She will be greatly missed by the students and staff members at Charles Warren Fairbanks. And I just want to add that you know this is a this woman. I mean, she put up a good fight, and she um, you know she and I graduated from Broad Ripple together. She always had a smile on her face. She loved stu her students, and um, and she was just a very gifted music teacher, and so she will be greatly missed. I wanted to give a shout out to Pat Payne, who continues to do the multicultural um, program out at Lafayette Square. It was very well done, very uh, well attended. Uh, Commissioner Hoops, I did see there, and there may have been other um, commissioners there. But I just want to thank her for her work and the students that participated. They were very talented, and so I always appreciate her and thank her for her work. Charles? I had the opportunity last night to attend the uh, presentation of uh, Beauty and the Beast at Edison School for the Performing Arts, and although it's an innovation school, they're still our children. And uh, it was great. The children did all of the sets themselves, um, costuming. It, it was just a really great performance uh, for elementary students to have uh, worked on. And actually, they're doing it three nights, I think. I think tonight is the last night. So kudos to them. It was a great job. Uh, our next regular meeting will be our agenda review session on Tuesday, June 26th, beginning at 6 p.m. in this room. I want to again congratulate all the vows and sows we honored this evening, as well as the entire graduating class of 2018. May I have a moment, sir? Oh, I forgot about <laughs> you. <laughs> I usually <laughs> defer, uh, uh, but uh, I just want to quickly acknowledge, again, our valedictorians and salutatorians, and as reminded, as Commissioner Arno uh, spoke about our children, I think you know, it is a testament of the impact of Indianapolis Public Schools as we think about the number of students tonight that were recognized that were first generation high school graduates, that will be first generation college graduates. Uh, it's inspiring knowing um, that we are part of a public school system that is truly serving as an equalizer and a balance wheel in, in the way that public schools was intended to be. And so again, I think it's, it's something that we should celebrate, not only for those students, but also um, how it speaks to how important our work is in giving students an opportunity in life. And so I just wanted to take a few moments to share that. Here, here. I apologize for not. It's uh, okay. I, I know I don't use it all. <laughs> uh, and I do want to say uh, to those who aren't graduating that there's another two weeks of school, and I want to wish them all a great close of the school year. Uh, having completed all the items on the agenda, this meeting is adjourned. Ooh.